for whatever reason, like that was something that I really just took ownership of and like wanted this thing to be the best it could be. I managed to build, let's say a brand around disintegrating stuff. Oh, we need something disintegrated. It's like, let's go get Alan. Hey everybody, Chris Kelly here with ProductionCrate.com. Welcome to the Creators Channel. Today I am joined by Alan McKay, visual effects supervisor and technical director. Alan has worked on films like Flight, Bloodshot. He has done video game cinematics. Alan has a really, really awesome reel, which you should definitely check out. Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Alan, can you give everybody a little more detail on your background and what you do? I guess I've been in the industry for 25 years. I've been working at Industrial Light & Magic, Blur, Pixelmondo, Ubisoft, you know, a lot of uh, different places like that over the years. These days I tend to focus a lot more on helping people with their career as well. That's definitely kind of been a, a big passion of mine as well. How did you go from high school dropout to visual effects? Persistence, I guess. I'd always been an artist, so I'd always loved drawing and I didn't really have much money. I lived with my mom. So I got kind of used to, you know, kind of if I need to make something happen, I got to do it myself. So my first computer I got through um, selling my artwork and just kind of hassling everyone. I I meet on a bus or a train, like, you know, here's my artwork, do you want to buy some? And I got into 2D animation doing like pixel by pixel, like using deluxe paint. And I was always kind of fixated on how clean and plasticky all this 3D stuff was that was coming out at the time. And, and when I finally discovered 3D and got like 3D Studio DOS and Pavre and a few other ones like that, that's where I just went all in. What are some of your favorite tools or advancements in the industry that you have seen? I think ZBrush is just for me, like mm -hmm. when I look at how much that changed the game, typically you would need to get very savvy in computers before you could start pushing around polys and, and doing this sort of thing. But ZBrush came along, it became so intuitive that everyone could start messing around and sculpting and figure out a way to utilize it for what they're doing. So I thought that has been really powerful. It's very easy to point like, oh, that bit of tech is really cool. Or that program's really cool. But I think it's more the companies who kind of create community or the tools that allow people who don't have a massive amount of technical knowledge behind them to be able to be an artist doing this sort of thing. That to me, I think is really interesting. Out of all of the various roles that you have played or worked on, do you have a favorite? I've really found it to be really fortunate that you can pivot very easily. You can move sideways in your career. So there's been years where I um, started producing and supervising exclusively, and that was really fun for a while. And I think just as a producer, there's so many things I, I learned that going back on the box again, I was way better at self-managing myself and kind of the commitment of time that I'm willing to give something, knowing that the grand scheme of things, I've got all these other things to do. And that to me is just kind of allowed me to kind of manage myself and manage other people a lot better. But that's the thing is like the more I'm off the box, then occasionally I'll get back on and I'm like, oh man, this is great. Like I don't have a thousand moving parts. I've got my headphones on and I get to do one thing. Like mm -hmm. that can be really peaceful knowing that you're not having to worry about the big picture and all these moving parts that you're not really responsible for. And you know, every artist is essentially holding you captive to their schedule and, and what they're promising that they're gonna deliver. Was yeah. there a favorite film or a favorite project that you worked on that you kind of have as like this is this is your personal flagship i worked on the live action commercial of god of war for the super bowl for whatever reason that just really resonated like they they called me up and they sent me the storyboards and and just seeing the boards like i didn't really know much about god of war for whatever reason like that was something that i really just took ownership of and like wanted this thing to be the best it could be. I think also mm -hmm. Avengers Endgame, like that one was another one that I really loved. And it's kind of funny because a lot of these like working on Blade and like all these other movies along the way, like each one- You disintegrate kind of... something, right? Well, that's I think all it. three of those projects, there's like a big disintegration. Effect. Exactly. When Avengers came up, that was because of God of War. Before that was Daybreakers. And I got Daybreakers because the directors in the film, they're like, we kind of want something like Blade. I managed to build, let's say, a brand uh, around disintegrating stuff. And so it isn't that you're getting pigeonholed. It's just you're occupying all these different pockets where when someone thinks, oh, we need something disintegrated, it's like, let's go get Alan. So you had this awesome career and then you decided to pass on the knowledge I always wanted to kind of show people what I had figured out so that way they didn't have to go down 
the same path. And I, I love that too, because some people will learn something and then they'll go and expound upon what I've done and make it better. And then I get to learn something from them. And so I, I love mm. just this kind of back and forth that everyone's sharing. But it's only been like the last year that I started kind of getting more into YouTube and just deciding to publish a lot of things that I, I feel people need rather than it being put out a tutorial for the sake of a tutorial. It's more, you know, I've given talks in the past on stage where I deconstruct my reel. I always thought that model of doing things worked really well. So I'm like, well, what if I deconstructed, you know, film work and talked about how I would tackle it or whatever. And it's just more kind of giving a bit of a behind the scenes view of like deconstructing a shot and what goes into it. So you're looking at the final product, but getting a bit of a glimpse into potentially how to approach doing something like that, which for a lot of people, it's a bit of a mystery. Like they're doing 3D, but they don't see the full picture. Mm -hmm. and this is a chance to, to get a bit more of that. Like the first time I did it was Venom. And in the back of my mind, like I'm pointing out mistakes and things that are going on, but I'm also trying to have the back of the people doing it saying like, there's always a, a story behind it. You can see the samples are wrong or this is, this is bad, mm -hmm. but there's probably a reason behind this. And, you know, so I'm, I'm always wanting to be brutally honest, but I'm also wanting to kind of defend why, let's say in a movie trailer, something mightn't look very good. It's like, well, you need to understand that we have temp deliveries. And that means that usually we might need to deliver, you know, semi-final shots six months before the movie comes out. And then we go back to making it better. So there's always something that we've got to kind of take into consideration when we're looking at this stuff. Indie to semi-amateur visual effects that are focusing on more on internet content, viral videos, some commercial work, and now social media has been really, really big. How do you feel about like that side of visual effects versus, you know, like the, the feature film blockbuster side? If anything, it's allowing independent filmmakers to be able to go out there and do this stuff. If I looked at the last 10 years, the amount of feature film directors I know who just popped up because they went and made a short film for next to nothing mm -hmm. and put it online and got enough attention around it. It's been really genius. It's like a lot of my friends who've managed to shotgun their career into directing big, big films. Mm -hmm. And it's always been that going and, and doing something for a low budget, putting it online, letting people know about it ahead of time. And then when you get the views, it's basically saying that there's a proven audience for it. Like if you got a million views on your short film, that means that there's people interested in this. Let's go make it. Suddenly Lights Out becomes a feature film or suddenly uh, another movie gets green lit because it got staff pick of the week on uh, Vimeo and mm -hmm. um, enough people saw it that it's like, okay, there's an interest for this. So it's kind of market testing without needing to have a product made first to say who wants to go see this movie. I like the fact that there's this disruption where people can go and um, make you know, cave trolls or monster hunters or whatever you, you want to do, knowing that there's an audience um, there for it, you're going to be able to kind of jump right into becoming the next Gareth Edwards or Neil Blomkamp just because you took an independent route rather than having to go the, the old school way of going through the big studios and hoping that you manage to, you know, buddy up to the right person. I do have a couple speed questions before you go. Mm -hmm. Great for those. I'll, I'll, give, I'll make him short since I know I've been going on for a while. No, no, it's all good info. Who is the best villain in any movie? I'm No Country for Old Men. I was just trying to think of Oh my about. gosh, what is his name? Yeah, such a good villain. So Javier Bordem was the yeah. actor. Um, if you could own any spacecraft from any popular culture TV show, movie, book, whatever, what spacecraft would it be? I'm just gonna cheat this one to say Millennium Falcon. Oh, um, man, yeah, yeah. I, I got nothing that's coming to mind right you now. You half the world. Uh, are you reading any books right now? Usually I'm trying to read a book a week at the moment. So um, I was just reading The Alter Ego from uh, Todd Herman. What VFX shot, it could be a scene or like a single shot, has held up the best over the years? I always go back to the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, you know, like, especially because most people don't even realize that the car is 3D as well when he's like chewing it apart in certain shots knowing that they got to spend months on you know a couple of minutes of CG to really mm -hmm. try and sell it. Can you tell our listeners and our viewers where they can find your work? If you go to alanmckay.com, I guess like that's a, a good place to go. And you run uh, your own podcast. I think you've got like over 300 episodes or something, right? Yeah, that's on the website as well. You can check it out there. Alan, it was uh, great to talk to you. Been following your work for a while. And yeah, nice to finally chat. Thanks, man. This has been a blast. Thank you. Take Thanks it easy. Lot, man. See ya. See you, man.